And so the little hand is on the two and the big hand is on the zero. And that means we press the big red button. And I'm not seeing anything on the YouTube thing. There it goes. Okay. <laughs> I was just a little nervous there. Hey, everybody. Happy Friday. Happy Pi Day Friday. I see people pile in. Way to go. I sit here with egg yolk all over my face, embarrassment to the gills about what happened last Friday. I am so sorry. We have done, uh, this is our 57th episode. I have done 56 of them in a row up until that one. So this should have been 58, but uh, I'll explain what happened as the, the day goes on. Uh, we got a big day. Uh, it's a fun day. It's an easy day. It's not one of those ones that... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Scott's got to put this stuff in public. It's just good stuff. But if he puts it on the back channel, then it stays on the back channel unless there's a reason to bring it forth. You funny man, Scott. I tell you that for sure. So good afternoon. This is Pi Day Friday. I am Dave Rush, Senior Instructor at Total Seminars. We get together once a week at 2 o'clock Central Time on this very, uh, this very channel, the Total Seminars YouTube channel to talk about CompTIA certifications and Raspberry Pis and how to put those things together to improve our opportunities to study for those of us who are locked down due to the pandemic situation that continues to exist and crash through the worldwide society. So sorry about all that. Uh, man, I was looking at this a year ago saying, yeah, a year to be behind us. Uh, and then, bleh. Well, you all know what happened between the variants and the new variant, the mu variant, 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 variant that got all the press this weekend and <clears throat> wars and nonsense. So let's make it a happy day and put all that silliness uh, behind us for a day or for a couple hours and enjoy each other's company. Let's ask questions. Let's talk about CompTIA. Let's talk about Raspberry Pis. Let's talk about anything technical. Uh, in fact, if it ain't religion or politics, I am totally up for it. Really enjoyed uh, our little other conundrum two weeks ago uh, where I was doing the show from my father's house and uh, he didn't have a, an internet that allowed us to show pies and, and share pie screens. It was a, a very unusual uh, configuration that uh, since I was shutting his cable off, I didn't bother to ask the tech support people, but uh, I can't wait to see his last cable bill because I got a feeling they were selling him a pile of uh, uh, public IP addresses that he never <laughs> needed. Uh, but so we fixed that by just taking questions for the whole session. We did about uh, an hour and 35, hour and 40 minutes worth of Q&A, and it was good questions, good stuff. So and really enjoyed that. Last week, we had a technical difficulty, and it was just, I couldn't connect to the internet, and you know, I'll tell you about it. So the good news is I've had a, a presentation ready to go for two weeks, and even though it's ready to go, here I was this morning doing last checks, and hey, you know what? I didn't do this. Let's make sure this works, and next thing you know, I'm writing a whole bunch more, and so I've been multitasking this morning, doing my work <clears throat> for the company, and oh yeah, there's one more thing I've got to get into uh, my outline. And of course, I had already set up and uh, published the downloadable outlines last night. So then you got to recreate the whole zip file and get those copied up to the, uh, the development web server, test it there, and then get it sent up to the production web server. But it's there. Uh, so everything that I'm going to talk about today, except for a paragraph that I just wrote, you don't need it. It's not going to be real critical, uh, but I'll mention it when I get there. Uh, you can download all of the notes and archives that I'm doing today. There isn't much. Um, the outline is the only thing that you really need. I've got all the uh, other uh, sundry accoutrements that I use as I do these things, but the outline uh, today is the only thing that you really are probably interested in. Uh, there is no downloads for the last three weeks because uh, three weeks ago we did our anniversary show. Two weeks ago uh, was the debacle. It was just q a it wasn't really a debacle at my father's house and of course it was nothing for last week because there was no show so don't panic if it looks like there's missing dates and missing stuff for you to download it ain't there but today's is there um you know tell you what i will uh 
put the web server up right now. Scott, you're listening. You're bored. Uh, would you put the uh, the Pi R Square link up? And that'll be open all day, and I'll probably keep it open all weekend. It's a three day weekend here. You heard me mention Scott. Yeah, I know everybody here. The eight people that have piled in so far know who Scott is. But if you're not watching this live and you're finding this amazing, who is this Dave guy and who is this Scott that he's talking about? Well, let me tell you, Scott is Scott Jernigan, my partner in Pi. He is the uh, head editor at Total Seminars, a writer, uh, a co-writer with Mike Myers, a writer in his own regard, musician, LARPer. And uh, I've even seen him cut grass at times. So he's he is just a true multitasker. Uh, he was planning on joining us on cam today. Uh, and then, of course, he's always got a, a meeting with our publisher at uh, the same time that the show ends here, four o'clock local time. And he looked at it and said, I am so close to finishing up something that I could get in today and, and make them very happy. So he's decided for today to multitask. And I've recommended to him that you know, I love working with him on screen. I love watching him work with Mike on screen. But this project is so huge and so big. Um, I am recommending to him that he continue to uh, work so or uh, work on his projects. And when he's got it behind him and he has a chance to uh, catch a mental break, then join up again and we'll start on here. Okay, I'm not sure that you heard that. So I'm going to do this show notes. And what are we talking about? Oh, pi r square. Okay. So we have this little pi r square server that I keep up and running periodically. By the way, if it's not up and running and you need to get a, an old archive document or something like that from it, kick me off a note, catch me on Discord. I'll put the Discord links up in a little while uh, and say, hey, I need it up and I will bring it up for you and you can get what you need. And I'll probably leave it up for the rest of the day whenever you ask for that. All right, I just posted the link for the Pi R Square server at uh, time mark 207. It's Pi R Square, the letter R, no dashes or anything, dot zapto, Z A P T O dot org. You can read it just as well as I can. This is an AMA. In fact, this is a DR AMA. And let's go really crazy. It's a DR AMA AS. It's dramas. Dave Rush, ask me anything. And Scott, while he may not be here in picture, he is here working the back channel. And so we'd like you to ask questions, but if you have a long question, if you're shy, if you're not watching this live and you can't post a question on YouTube, on the YouTube chat, well, there are other ways to accomplish that. And I encourage you to contact myself, contact Scott, contact Mike Myers himself. You'll see the pattern on how to do that. And you can do that this way. <clears throat> Just reach out to me at Dave R at totalsem.com because I work for Total Seminars and my name is Dave Rush. Uh, you can also use my personal email, drushtx at Yahoo. You can contact Scott, smart guy. He, he's, he'll he'll ask or answer anything, including musical questions. He's Scott Jernigan, Scott J at totalsem.com. And I don't have it up here, but uh, Michael Myers is Michael M. And guess where he works? Yes, totalsem.com. He has nothing to do with the Mike Myers that's in the uh, Friday the 13th movies or in the uh, Shrek movies and similarly. Re uh, who's the who's the spy? Austin Powers. OK, but he is Mike Myers and has definitely something to do with total seminars and the best CompTIA certification practice books out there and videos and other products, our Total Tester product, our Total Sims product. He's got his fingers in all those pies. Well, let's see what the handy dandy notes here are. Now, you know what, let's just get right to it. I've killed nine minutes, that's plenty. So 152, Tullowit checked in, good morning, good after morning all. Tullowit. And I don't see any of, uh, I don't know where IIs is from, Mavens here. I'll come back and get everybody. Um, I'm working on this idea. Uh, I want to do a, a weekend podcast of, of something unrelated to this, uh, just my own personal thing. But I'm looking at the, the likely participants. It'll be you guys and 
some others with uh, an interest along the, the lines that I'm doing for, uh, but I want to make it available to everyone live. So I got Tolowit over in the mid Pacific. We got lots of Europeans. We've got some Middle Easterns. Uh, so finding a time that's good for the entire planet is not possible. So it's kind of an Arnold Palmer. The iced tea that I made this week, my wife didn't make it. I made it very poorly. I, it, it's so weak, you can almost see through it after several days of steeping. So I figured I'd whip up some iced tea and then maybe mix it up together. <coughs> Excuse me. Jason Helm, what up, my man? So we've had a lot going on with uh, Jason in the last couple of days working on a, a video challenge. And it looks like he's got a direction now. Scott's here. He poked in a couple minutes before. Patricia Grace, our favorite lady nerd in Florida. Nerd is the word, the, said the entire herd. <laughs> a, a double check mark and a yep. And I see you hear you. Okay, I like it. One check for video, one check for audio. And then a confirmation was seen here. Thank you very much. Dr. Quinn, great to see you. Man, I love when you turn up here. Okay. <clears throat> Sometimes my phone wonks when there's back channel news, but that was a, a different and unrelated wonk. Oh, there we go. Scott put it here. You sound as smooth as chocolate ice cream sliding on a hot sidewalk. <laughs> it's, I love the smoothness thing. I, I see that in my mind and, and tears begin to flow down. Chocolate ice cream on a sidewalk. That's, there's only one call for that. She's passed away, but I would have called my dog. Ice cream. Aye, aye. Happy Friday to you, aye, aye. Patricia, it kind of spreads more than it slides. Well, I don't know. Maybe you, well, you're in Florida, you're in flatland. All you got to do is be in a little bit of hill country. Uh, so I was back home, my original home, uh, two weeks ago or so. And uh, it's interesting. Here in Houston, the idea of a hill is just that. They're just ideas. Uh, but uh, pretty heavy hill country in north central, mid central, I don't know how to describe it, Ohio. Uh, and that was so fun, parking on hills again and giving my wife a little practice time uh, driving stick on hills because she doesn't get, much, doesn't get much of that around here. We drove, each way was 29 hours, if you include a six-hour nap stop. Uh, so I, except for a restroom break and, and fill the tank a couple of times, I love my diesel car, by the way. Uh, what is it, 1,300, almost 1,400 miles. Uh, I started on a full tank and I filled it twice <clears throat> and that takes care of business. I love that thing. Uh, but man, that's a, just a lot, a lot of driving and being trapped in what is otherwise a very comfortable car. Uh, there we go. That's got, that's it. <laughs> it's got ahead, of, got ahead of me. We have tilted sidewalks in Houston a little bit. Ben Feliciano, good to see you, my friend. It has been a while. And I had just passed, still don't have power, but have better phone signal. Okay, well, that's somewhat good news. Uh, yeah, I understand some of you guys are going to be out of power for quite some time. We had uh, Hurricane Ike here a couple of years ago. Uh, I was out of power at this site for 13, 14 days. And as a result, I have 80 gallons of gas that I keep in my shed that I load up before uh, hurricane season. And then when hurricane season is over uh, for the gasoline cars, I don't go to the gas station for quite some time. I just empty those out there and then get them recycled for the next year. <clears throat> but glad you got phone signal and I hope you're uh, staying safe. I, you have a, enough capability to uh, stay warm or cool or get food and all those good things. You're alive, I see. <clears throat> Scott, who? <laughs> yeah, and uh, hey, for those of you, I don't see him on here yet, but uh, Andrew Hutz, uh, who's a regular on the forums and now works for Total Seminars, uh, he's in Philly, and they got uh, a good bit of devastation themselves over the, the past couple of days. He's fine, everybody asks, <clears throat> but there we go. 
Reading messages, Maven, did Texas get hit as well? No, the only thing that I saw in Texas was one little touch of outer band got over into the Lufkin area, but no, it was much uh, farther toward you. Of course, the center was right in your neck of the woods, uh, right up around Slidell and uh, over New Orleans. And then of course the dirty side, if you don't live in Hurricane Alley, uh, there are terms and phrases that we use that mean something to all of us and may not mean something to you. Hurricanes have a dirty side. The dirty side is the right side, the east side of it, because you know, it's comma shaped, right? And the winds flow counterclockwise. Let's do it that way so you can see that. And so it's picking up all that moisture over here and bringing it up where it rains out and then it gets less and less and less and the bands are narrower over on the western side of hurricanes, at least in this hemisphere. <clears throat> so uh, Slidell and Mobile, Alabama, they were really uh, mangled on the dirty side. And then as it continued to arc up uh, through the northeast, the dirty side kind of became west and southwest of that thing. Let's see, found out that up north got hit with the aftermath. They say I should have power by the 8th. But luckily, I have a good neighbor with a generator. Good news. So five days, huh? Um, I hope that, that they are right in their prediction. One of the things that uh, we learned here during that 13-day outage is the daily prognostications of when power were going to be uh, returning to a given neighborhood. Not a prayer. They missed it all the time. <laughs> you don't like two gallons around. Yeah. Yeah. If it all goes up, there's going to be a mighty, <laughs> uh, yeah, what's the right word there? Come up and let's go with that. I love Fridays. Me too. Raymond quick. Hello all sir. Lego podcast, man. I just can't get into Legos. They got that Lego show on television. I, I just want to shoot my television when I see it. I can't flip away fast enough. Legos are probably cool, but what they've done with this show is what all American production companies do. They've, they've over-dramatized it, and we need explosions and dolphins, live dolphins. And <laughs> Oh, wait, Andre is here. How do you know? Oh, there, I missed Andre. Sorry, it's up there. Andre is busy eating dinner, building Legos for my son, and watching drama. That's, that's multitasking. Uh, and, of course, you've got web, web, uh, a cool VM project underway. Uh, does, does, uh, keeps the gallons. That was supposed to contain. <laughs> I keep gas can around for the Tesla. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that makes sense. You should have a gas can around for your Tesla and a little four-wheeled trailer that holds the... Uh, <laughs> I am just been drinking too much today. The generator. So when the Tesla or Leaf runs out of power, then you can fire that thing up and get a, a quick charge going on, <laughs> on, the, on the vehicle. <laughs> Way to go, Scott. <laughs> Keep that ass gas can near your leaf and laugh at it. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a caught up on questions that I've got published here. <clears throat> Let me see what's in Mac notes. Scott's moderating. We're here to advance. It's the 57th episode. It is a presentation of Total Seminars. We do this once a week. Mike Myers does his show twice a week, Monday at 2 o'clock local time and Wednesday at 2 o'clock local time. A little more broad-based, a little more depth on CompTIA stuff. And his presentations and projects uh, tend to be built around uh, specific CompTIA topics or topics in general, uh, computer technology that he finds interesting and educational. So ours, a little more geared toward using Raspi's in a CompT environment, sometimes just in its own environment. Today we're uh, we're talking about cloning drives within a Raspberry Pi. So you can clone anything to anything. I'll get into it in full detail, but there's a micro SD card slot back here. We got USB slots here. Uh, you can clone 
from to from to from to you get the idea anything can be cloned to anything show you how to do that because uh, it's got great use and it has some relevance to a plus objectives and maybe uh security plus objectives when they talk about operating system deployment uh technologies processes protocols so here is a a potential distribution method disbursement method uh, as ever my thanks to mike myers for letting me use this platform on company time <laughs> don't get me wrong i typically work about 15 to 16 hours a day doing company stuff so getting a break to do this is a real joy uh, my thanks as always to scott of course uh, for his incredible expertise in so many areas in presentation in technology in a, a ton of other stuff and some of our other experts in-house mike myers uh, sorry michael smyer uh, mike myers and others who don't appear on here andrew hutz who's uh, appearing more and more as a back channel and and deeper participant than a watcher who asks questions and goes gaga over it so look forward to his greater participation participation as time goes by easy for us to say did that did that we got specials still and the specials are consistent right now because uh everybody knows kathy kathy is uh, out of town uh, taking some vacation time and as such let's do this uh, she's keeping the specials the same right now it takes a little bit of effort uh, a good bit of effort to modify all the things that need to be modified in the the shop and all that good stuff but here's a link for today's specials posted at the present time which is oh man <laughs> Oh, that's crazy. If I put a, there's a, yeah, whatever, it doesn't matter. All right. So present time is what? 2.22, 22 minutes past the beginning of showtime. We'll put this up here and share it. I started setting up this week, late one night, OBS instead of using zoom to stream and it went okay i am generally ready to do it um i wanted to get with one of the experts in our company michael smyer uh to do any tweaking and, and do some experimenting before i go live with it but my expectation is to go live on obs next week why what does that bring to the party uh it brings a bunch and it takes away one thing when we have uh when scott and i join up and do this together again we'll do zoom because obs doesn't have the capability yet to link in other input over the the net streams but what it does do is it allows me to create scenes like the one that you're looking at right now so when i want to share a screen i don't have to go find the screen go to zoom click share screen go find the screen in the resulting menu share it and then unshare it i can simply in obs uh just click on a scene click on a scene and they're all set up in advance so that's how mike does that so quickly he uses obs all right if that's not what you wanted to talk about q a specials for this week remember we only offer it to those of you who are watching these q a's live or in person they're usually they're good for a week we start them up on monday morning and they shut down at sunday night i don't know what time but this week's special 50% off uh, bundles, where the bundles are the same product, ebook, and total tester. So we have those for A plus. There's an A plus ebook and an A plus total tester. Same for Net plus, same for Security plus, same for Cybersecurity Analyst, Pen Test plus, AWS Systems Architecture Associate. The code in Kathy's absence, she told me to set them up and they're real easy. It's just uh, the date on Monday in US date format. So 0830-21. Go to totalsem.com, load up your loot pile, make sure you include some bundles. And when you apply this code at checkout, the bundles will be 50% off. And that's good through this Sunday. Teachers, if you're teaching uh, 
CompTIA courses, we want you to contact Kathy Y, Kathy Yale at totalsem.com. She has stuff to help you out. Cheap, sometimes cheaper than cheap, if you know what I'm saying. So we call that Mike's teacher feature. All right, back to notes. And then I see lots of stuff is going on up there. I often remind people about our projects uh, that they don't always require Raspberry Pi. In fact, about 90% of our projects that we do on this AMA, on this drama, doesn't need a Raspberry Pi. Today is one of the exceptions. There is a utility that's made explicitly for Raspberry Pi to do what we're going to do. Now, you can clone drives on other systems. You use the DD command. I'll give you a little bit of info on that in class goes. But this is a utility that uh, created a GUI around the DD command and is made specific to Raspberry Pi. It knows how to talk to our micro SD card slots and things like that. Did that, did that, did that. Uh, let me do a, a quick mention where we've been, where we're going, and then back to uh, the Q&A stream. <laughs> well, that's bad note-taking on my part. So just to summarize, where we've been. Back on August 20th, we were on the road. I had a project of mine. It was this project. Uh, it was at my father's home. He had passed away the week previously. And so I was working in the house, you know, doing the things you have to do within a state and, and getting things packed away and figuring out how to get his bills paid and all that good stuff. Uh, and he had a good internet connection. So my plan was to bring the stuff down and do it. And I had it all set up. And then when I started testing, I said, wait a minute, every device here has a real public IP address. So my computer had a, a public IP address. They had family members there. They would connect. They'd get a public IP address that was different. Uh, and they were on different subnets. My sister's was on a, a different one. My wife's was on a different one. The Raspberry Pis were on a different one. And they couldn't talk to each other. There was some kind of firewall, barrier, non-route, whatever the heck it was between all the devices that they simply couldn't communicate with each other. And that made the show kind of pointless. So at least made the project pointless. So we did Q&A. Last week, August 27th, I'm all set up. I'm ready to go. 8.30 in the morning, the missus takes off to go to work. Uh, at a, right about that same time, the uh, a lawn maintenance person came out and they, doing their thing. And then at 8.45, I lost connection to the network. And no idea. I, 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 okay, the, the lawn guy, maybe he mangled the connection outside. I went and checked with that. And, uh, then I started working with physical connections. I worked for 10 and a half hours. Obviously, somewhere between 8.45 in the morning and 10 and a half hours later, the show was supposed to happen. And uh, we kind of gave it a... a a deadline that said, look, if we don't have this thing working by 1.30, then we bag the show because the chances of getting it in that next half hour are pretty light. And sure enough, at 1.30, we were just as dead as we always were. About 10 hours into troubleshooting, I had some functionality. And the things that I did, I, I swapped out routers three different times, three different make and model Soho routers. And, and I did horrible atrocities to my computer and I changed NICs and I disabled them and I changed Wi-Fi adapters and, and USB externals and everything. Uh, and somewhere at whatever time, 10 hours is later, uh, I had intermittent connectivity because I initially, of course, blamed my ISP. But uh, when I checked with the neighbors and they said, no, no, we're all fine. We're all in the same loop. So that wasn't it. And uh, but I had some limited connectivity and I noticed something. Now, you know, I've got 60 different items, more than that, uh, running here at the house that, that have IP addresses. All the Raspberry Pis have two IP addresses. They got a wired connection 
and a wireless connection. So I don't know their IP addresses. I have them uh, in various utilities that I can access them by their names and by descriptions. I've got the uh, blue and white striped one. I got the blue uh, mesh one. I have the red one. I've got the official res. So I don't know those IP addresses, but there are a couple of them whose IP addresses I really do know and I know well because uh, I work with them natively at their IP address. Okay. Um, and I was looking at trying to print something. No, I wasn't. Uh, I tried to open up one of the web servers as the web server on one of those two boxes that I know very well. And the web management interface on my printer popped up. I had to think about that for a second. So I went over and I double checked, what is the IP address of this printer? Well, good golly, it's the same as the IP address of one of the two Raspberry Pis that I use all the time. And that became the head slapper. I don't know why this happened, but somehow some of the devices in-house suddenly got new and different IP addresses and some of them conflicted. In fact, I think at least one of them conflicted with the default IP address of my gateway router. And that was probably the cause. So over the next couple of minutes, I went and disconnected just about everything in the house, uh, except for a couple of things, the things that were working intermittently and pff, everything worked like a dream. So, okay, we definitely know that there is one or more devices here that's causing the problem. Uh, I have always taught that an IP address conflict between two different hosts will have one of three consequences. One will work and the other won't. The other will work, but the one won't. Both will work intermittently. But the one thing that I don't teach, I haven't taught, but will now, is it can bring down your entire network. Now, that may be because, again, the conflict was with the Soho gateway router. So maybe it didn't bring down the whole, the whole network just because it was a conflict, but because it was a conflict with something that was necessary to get to the internet. But that was the cause and the cure. Uh, every day since then, uh, I have taken two or three RASPIs, hooked them up in an isolated way, set their IP addresses, plug them on the network, test, make sure everything is copacetic. Uh, yesterday was the big test. I've been running out without my pie hole since Friday. Ooh, ads everywhere on every place I go. And so I had to go get the, the pie hole running. It's running. <sighs> I'm happy. And there's still a few more devices that I have to bring online. My pie cluster here. He's taken offline and I got to go get all those guys running again. Uh, a couple other things up on the, the upper desk here, but everything that's plugged in is working and I can talk to you. So there's that. So that was last week. And then where we're going this week, we are doing what we plan to do last week. And the week before we'll make a clone of a storage device that's plugged into a raspberry Pi. The, the clone that we're going to do today, will clone the micro SD card. That is the primary boot and usage device storage device. Excuse me. Uh, but you can clone any, plug in storage media in a pie to any other plug in -able. There's a magic in doing there. The live micro SD card. When you try to do that in some systems, well, I'll explain it. Bottom line, it may or may not work. It probably will have issues at best. So I'll describe why that is and how we solve that problem. All right, that gets me caught up on there. All right, we'll come back to that. Let's go see what's going on on chat. Sorry, something's funny here. There we go. But Dave, you're not laughing. It couldn't be that funny. All right, we're back in bits. Hey, there he is. I was just talking about you before you reappeared. Andrew Hutz is here. 
Lego podcast. Okay, what do we got here? Now we're now we're cooking, man. Uh, I just finished finished my multitasking for the moment. I got a brisket in the Traeger. Urgh. I was looking at Traegers two days ago. I had to run an errand and get some supplies for uh, this work project, and there they were. I was in Ace Hardware, and Traeger has my name on it. Made my own garlic sauce. Nice. <laughs> Helps with social distancing and keeping vampires away. All right. So I'd skip those. I got to pass them. Now we go. Got to power the generator to recharge it. Yep. You have a Yaris? Oh, okay. You can have a Yaris in Hawaii. Reading questions here. All right. I am, um, I'm at 219. If you're following along, how are we doing here? 35, 15 minutes behind. That's normal. David Rush, I got that project up and running. Just can't log into the app store. So I'll need an original. So, right. I saw that uh, discussion between you guys. It concerns me that you actually have an account. I know you need a serial number too, but it concerns me that you have an Apple account. And however, I have two. And it's, they're they're not related. Freaking Apple. Uh, I have one for my uh, iTunes account, and it's not the same as my Apple account. I have to have an Apple account because temporarily I had a uh, an iPhone still in the cupboard. <laughs> Maven at 220, I was doing some research on inverters. I found out modified wave isn't as good as pure waves, pure sine wave, of course, for delicate. Any thoughts or input? Absolutely, completely in agreement. Uh, I haven't killed anything with uh, sawtooth wave, which is the non sine wave. It's really easy for inverter circuitry to produce. It's inexpensive. It doesn't take a lot of components to make a pure sine wave. Uh, it makes an inverter much more expensive. However, the, the, the non-sharp, here's the problem. When you have sawtooth currents, instead of, you know, a nice sine wave, it looks like triangle. <clears throat> when you get to the peak and valley and they change direction and current flow, there are current surges that can damage delicate electronics. So if you're going to plug in something that's not, uh, a skill saw, a table saw, you know, some big powerful thing that says, I just eat power and I don't care what it is or what it looks like. Uh, then you want something that's pure sign and that costs a lot more money. But yeah, that's my thoughts. Raymond Quick, I have a script on one of my pies that I made to make a clone of another pie, then shrink the clone to make deployable image so we can roll out standard image to all of our pies. Excellent. I would be very interested in that script. Raymond Quick, if you would please contact me by email and either just contact me and we'll have a, a regular nice conversation or send me that script. I love it um, because what I'm teaching today here is a two-step process. One, the creation of the clone, and then the other is the shrinking of the partition so you can find me at either of these two addresses, Dave R at totalsem.com or drushtx at Yahoo. And mention to me your, uh, your YouTube moniker. So I will recognize, I'll recognize it based on what you're uh, sending or, or the communication that you're trying to do, but that helps me out a little bit. Thank you. That's, that's interesting. And I find that both interesting and exciting. I'll bet it was fun. Andre Tolowit and oh, I, guess I super scrolled. Hang on, I got it marked. <laughs> and power from the grid made by coal burning flower. <laughs> yeah, I so want to get into this thing. I Tolowit, I think you and I are of a mindset here. I, I, it'll be great when electric vehicles meet two objectives that they sometimes claim to meet now. And in my mind, and in my studies, my very careful studies, they are nowhere close. One, distance slash capacity. Man, it's ridiculous, utterly ridiculous. And two, they're clean. 
No, they're not. They generate more pollution than ICE engines when you take into account everything that's involved to generate the electricity that goes down the line. Okay, I know I opened up a holy war. I'm not going to get into it on, on today's topic. I'm already chewing up uh, time, but you cannot show me research that proves the opposite of what I just said. Okay. Yes, that does sound like a fun project. Raymond Quick, Scott Jernigan started with trying to automate setting up new pies for our network, and then I got lazy. That's why God made scripts. We're not lazy, we're just efficient. Makes the clone, saves it as a temp file, then makes a shrunk file. Oh, that's a different approach than what I'm going to do here. Andre, what about a VM? Will that work today? Sure. Sure, absolutely. If what you're asking is, I just took a clone, I took my, my micro SD card that's got Raspberry Pi OS on it. I cloned it. Now, I'll pull it out for a minute and leave it in. Who cares? It all works. Now, install a VM, like the VMware one. Yeah, uh, yeah the VMware one. They've got a, a nice VM for Raspberry Pi. Fire that up and then use that card to load an OS into the VM. Yeah, you could do it. Um, what you've got are size issues. <laughs> yeah, what you're gonna have to do is kind of reverse them. That's a sweet thing. I'm getting ahead of myself here and some of this may not make sense to everybody, but hang on here. So you always wanna clone a, a given size card, let's make it a fist size card to a fist size card or a bigger one, right? Because you can't clone this size card to this size other card. Now I want to take all this and put it in the storage area on here in a VM. Well, that's not going to work. So what you're going to have to do is take the bigger card after you've resized all the partitions and make that your boot and primary operating system, then make this old card that was smaller into the, uh, the image that's going to get installed. It's not necessarily an image, but into the OS that's going to be installed into the VM. <laughs> I like the way you think. Circular. Catherine is here. Oh, yay, you're on. I had no idea you wouldn't be. Yeah, sorry about it. If you looked for me last week, I weren't here. Andre, DHCP trouble, double IP addresses. Uh, no. So if they're DHCP, of course, you can configure uh, within the VM all kinds of different ways to deal with that. Uh, and what I would do is, is I have a cleanup process after I clone a card. It's three steps. One, change the partition size. Two, change the host name. Three, if I use static address, change the static address so it doesn't conflict. Conflict. Ip, ip. <laughs> What a guan says Steve G. How you going? Yes, yeah, Steve from Canada. And I didn't see our other Canuck here today, but I did see him on Discord. I'll throw the Discord. Uh, Scott, while I'm uh, getting through caught up here, there's only a few left. If you would be ever so kind as to throw the Discord links, that would be awesomeness. Sam Spade knew the corpse was a clown even before he got close enough to see it. It smelled funny. I love film noir. Man, do I love film noir. Okay. Maven, you're just back. You're going to have to go back and watch the archive to see the secret of life and how to win $5 million without trying. So we covered that, but had to refill the generator. <laughs> well, that makes sense. It's, it seems only fair. My generator uses nine gallons per day. So at 80 gallons, I got about 10, 10 days or so. David, I would look for it and send it right over. Thank you, sir. Oh, don't you go there, Green Power Fanatic. <laughs> yeah, I know. I started the Holy War. Sorry, man. Even uh, the big debate of going green, but you have to admit there's progress. I absolutely admit that. But then let's take into account 
the horrific damage to the earth the way they mine lithium. Ooh. <laughs> Feeding the fire. Thank you. Scott posted the link for the Discord servers uh, server at uh, 243. So the Discord server for the big dozen of us that are here. Hey, I haven't. Uh, oh, it's going up. I haven't liked yet. There we go. Now I've liked. So Jose Braden set up a Discord server for us quite some time ago. He did it for himself to talk about uh, the show, about Mike's drama show and the topics that are covered on the show. And it has grown by leaps and bounds. And there are 400 people plus on this Discord server. It's called the Unofficial Total Seminars Discord server. It's unofficial. We have nothing to do with it. We don't operate it. We didn't create it. We have no administrative capabilities on it. We are users on it, just like uh, everybody else. But man, what a tool it has grown into. What a positive tool with all the people, all the expertise, the, the folks that are there 24 hours a day and the folks that are there uh, a little less. The sub forums, there's my computer needs help and I need study people and there's Kali and there's Linux and there's Raspberry Pi forums and general forums. And after our live shows, one or more of us heads over to Discord server with mics and cameras and joins the, the crowd. I think last week we had, yeah, after the after Mike's last show, he celebrated his birthday on Discord. Uh, we had at least a dozen people uh, online. And if you don't have a camera or you're not interested in uh, sharing your face, that's fine. Come on over anyways after the show and uh, participate just by texting and you can watch us as we bandy about and wear silly hats and it may be a little bit saltier here we're very g-rated as we do our amas here but again we don't run discord over there and people are free to speak and write as they see fit and more power to them <laughs> the secret of life is a great song by faith hill it is a nice song i agree with you okay so join us on those links. Yeah, okay, there's a couple different links that Scott's posted, one at 243 and then a pair at 244. It's funny how they're different. Uh, one of them we get from the same source on there, uh, but they show up differently and that's okay. And if you go to any of those links and it says, this link is expired, just stick around on that page. And this works fine if you're watching this archive a year from now, it's okay, this'll work. Just look around on that page that says continue anyway, and you will join up. It's all good. Talking about fire, Tahoe's on fire. No, no, I don't have a Tahoe. It's a Yukon. It's a little bigger. Sometimes we live chat with voice and video there. Sometimes we play with Legos. No, Talibut, I think sometimes you play with legs. I've never seen you play with Legos there. What new technology? Hey, a, a question. Goodness gracious. 48 minutes into the show. What new technology is being used to study and aid these natural disasters? Wow. I'm not a climatologist or a meteorologist. I do study meteors, but for some reason, they won't call me a meteorologist. I don't know. I don't know. But we throw that open to the crowd. we got a lot of people here. Throw that open on the Discord server. Scott may know. <laughs> All right, caught up here at 247. Let me go see what else is in my notes and in the news. Interesting news, tricks and techniques of the week. Discuss technical issue that killed last week's show. I did. I skipped an actual question at 244. Let's go get it. Tell what? Oh, there we go. Question from Discord that I gave an answer for, but might bear discussing here. What is ECC RAM? And can the average mob use it? Good question, Tullowit. ECC, error correction code. So we basically have four kinds of RAM. Yeah, there's probably some other sub pieces in there. There's RAM, boring old dynamic RAM. It's got rows and columns of ones and zeros. And when we send a pulse to it, a strobe, it can send a row of bits or a byte or whatever, uh, or it can on a pulse receives. Therefore, the faster we pulse, the faster we can read and write data to RAM. We use the same core pulse 
that also feeds the CPU. And as such, we use a kind of DRAM these days called SD RAM, and we have for 25 years, synchronous dynamic RAM. All right, then we've got, so I'm missing a, a middle one here, ECC. Um, there is RAM that can detect an error. So here's what's supposed to happen. Uh, when we send data down, oh, parity RAM, sorry, parity RAM. When we send data down the, the RAM chip, to the fingers, we send eight bits for, for each byte, and then one more bit called a parity bit. And the parity bit is either odd or even. And what they do is the RAM chip adds up all the ones in the byte. And if the number of that it comes up with is odd, then it puts a one in the parity slot to make even parity. And that says, okay, good. Now, when the data goes, that's it. And likewise, if the ones all come up to an even number, then we put a zero in there. Well, the RAM chip can test that and say, whenever I get data, whenever I write data, when whoever created the parity bit, whatever circuit up in RAM created it and it made it way down to the fingers here, before I send it out, I'm going to do a double check on that. Uh, I'll calculate my own parity and say, okay, the parity bit should be a one or a zero. And if it's a match, huzzah, we got a good bit that's ready to go out of RAM and it gets sent out. If it's bad, and we're talking about parity RAM, if it's a mismatch, hey, it's got a number in there, it's one, and the total comes up to an odd number, then that's a bad byte and it simply doesn't send it. It gets evaporated. Then it's up to the program that was waiting for that data to respond. Hey, I'm missing that data. Or maybe even the system crashes. So that's parity RAM. Many modern computers, most modern computers, can work with boring old DRAM and parity RAM. ECC RAM is error correction code. Error correction code has kind of a double parity thing going on. And not only can it detect an error, but if there is one bit error in there, because of the formula used to generate this error correction code, it's not really parity, something else, then it can identify which bit was bad, correct it, it's error correcting code, and send the fixed byte out the line. Most traditional hobbyist computers and every pre-built computer from Dell, and HP and Compaq and name your favorite in there, they won't work with ECC RAM. About the only kinds of boxes that work with ECC RAM are server class boxes. They come from Supermicro, uh, Dell makes servers, HP makes servers, those use ECC. So we put them in computers that require high data reliability and those don't qualify uh, as hobbyist class computers. So no, but you know, it's something you can always look up in the specs before you buy your next motherboard. Check and see. I have seen a few hobbyist MOBOs that do support ECC RAM. And that's uh, not surprisingly a little pricier than your basic DRAM and parity RAM. Reading questions. Yes, thank you, Telewood. You dropped my I dropped your question. Now we got it. How do blockchains work? Ah, magic. Uh, you have to dance almost naked wearing goatskin chaps around a fire at midnight on Friday the 13th in order to make a blockchain work. Uh, I have looked at it superficially. Um, the long and short of it is it's a cryptographic string of arrays of entries that once encrypted and inserted into the chain can't be removed because the next part of the chain is dependent on that. So what you get is a permanent record that exists as a file stream, as a data stream that can't be corrupted 
or what the heck was that? Okay, it, it can't be corrupted. It can't be uh, changed to fudge records in there. Uh, and so, you know, the big challenge for some people is trying to uh, verify them. So we do with mining. Uh, some people are out there trying to crack them. No major blockchain has been cracked yet, though. It is my firm belief that when they they get quantum computing solidified and they focus on that, it will be gone in a heartbeat. But there's the short answer. I don't I don't have a long and better one. I'm sorry, Andre. Andre. They held keep the dead body on the bottom of the lake. Right. They held. Okay. <laughs> They help keep it. Got it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Did that. Did that. Pi R square. Dot Zapto. Dot org is up. It's got today's stuff in there. He should mention um, now more so than ever. Andrew Hutz has a blog. He does uh, a variety of topics: security, hacking things like that. I haven't heard and I haven't checked lately uh, to see if uh, he's done anything new. Uh, check in, Andrew, uh, Andre. Well, I get it. Andrew, Andrew, we'll make it American. Uh, let us know if you've got anything new poked up. And in the meantime, I will post a link for it here. Andrew Hutz's blog at tgasec.wordpress.com. Uh, I've really enjoyed reading the stuff that he's written. I haven't followed up in the last couple of weeks. All right, catch up on these last questions and then start on our project, which will not take a full hour by any stretch of the imagination. It's quick, it's easy, it's fun. Scott, I'm getting a, uh, a back channel phone call from Janelle. Would you... Uh, touch base with her and let her know what we're doing here and that I can talk to her after the show. Thank you. Okay, that is the end. That's caught up on the questions at 256. So let's talk about cloning storage devices. Thank you. So there's a lot of reasons to clone a storage device. Some people use it as a backup tool. It's not a bad way to go if you have enough media to pull that off. Uh, the by far and away most common reason is to do mass distribution, not huge quantities, but multiple distributions of a setup device, of a setup storage device here. But for whatever you've got, if you've got any kind of storage device, you got an external S a, H, a hard drive that's USB plugged in, a flash drive, a USB SSD, they've got uh, enclosures, USB enclosures for M.2 drives. Maybe I wanna clone something to a micro SD card, not just from one. Well, you can do that, whatever your rationale may be. So let me give you my big rationale. Well, I mean, no, let's not do that yet. I got a new list here. With the utility that we're gonna to use today, we'll call it PyClone. That's its official command line name, but we don't run it from the command line. Thank you, Scott. Uh, lost train of thought. Whatever your rationale is, you can clone anything, any storage device that can be attached and used as a storage device in a RASPI to another uh, storage device in a RASPI. It's got to be a file system that the, does it? No, I, it may not have to be a file system that the RASPI understands because the Pi clone utility does a block copy. So it really doesn't care. It's just going to say what's in block zero and Block zero holds four four thousand ninety six bytes or bits, whatever it may be, and it'll just put that into block zero on the other storage device. Same thing with block one, same with block two point nine million four hundred seventy nine thousand eight hundred sixteen. So, what do we need hardware wise? Well, we need a Raspberry Pi. We need storage media target and storage media source. 
Makes sense. And then you may need for your storage media target some kind of adapter, right? A USB enclosure. Uh, here's a, a USB media reader that supports one, two, three, four, five, six types of media. I've seen them that support 19. I've got one and uh, I just gave to my kid when he went back to college. It supports one, but it works fine for what I do. Software, you don't need to download any special software. It's already built into Raspberry Pi OS. Again, the, the direct name of the utility is PyClone, but it's very challenging to run PyClone directly from the command line. One, yeah, I'll show you why. Issue next, go out and buy a card, a, a micro SD card. Uh, and it says in the packaging, 16 gigabyte made by, I don't know, this one is uh, a house brand for Micro Center. And now here is a Kingston 16 gigabyte micro SD card. Are they the same size? Probably not. That's really amazing. It's really disappointing. I've seen 16 gig marketed cards that actually have 14 gigs in them. Sometimes they market them as Gibby bytes, sometimes as gigabytes, uh, and sometimes it's close to 16, but not quite the same thing. So the first thing you're going to have to find out is what the actual size of the two units are. Same if you're going to use something like a flash drive or your external drive of whatever type makes you happy. The target must be larger than the source. Now, the good news is our, Ply, our PyClone utility will check. And if it's mismatch sizes and the target is smaller, it'll say, you can't do this. So good news. But then you'll be upset because you got to order or go to the store and get one. So nice to know that in advance. So let's take a look and see if we can figure out how to determine the size of our micro SD. I'm going to set up a, I got a server running here. I'm going to set it up to share. All right, here's a Raspberry Pi. I believe it's a three. Yeah. I'm just, oh, yeah, there, okay. It is a three. When you want to know what's going on space-wise and usage-wise in broad terms about your storage media in a Linux box, the command of choice is DF minus H. And so I have what says is a 15 gigabyte card. If you look at the card, it says 16 GB. Eight and a half of it's used. Well, that should mean 10 or uh, seven is available, right? But only five is available. Well, that's because they break these up into different file systems. So the dev root, the main file system that we use every day is sucking up eight and a half, but I got all this stuff that's sucking up a lot more here and there. So there's a dev temporary file system and more temp file systems. One of these is a uh, virtual system. So 15 gigs, best I can do. Now I can plug this guy in uh, to my adapter and plug him in over there and find out his usage and size. Uh, I've done it. I'm not going to go through the hassle of plugging and unplugging multiple times. I don't want to screw things up here. So I know that it is smaller than the device that I'm planning on cloning to. Back to notes. Oops, pages and pages of notes. So DF space minus H, great useful command. Uh, do DF space minus minus help sometime and see all the other goodies that DF can do. The core command that PyClone uses is the DD command. 
it doesn't officially stand for anything anymore. It might have a million years ago. I did a little research on the origins of the term, uh, and there's absolutely no clear answer out there. The most common thing, it's been suggested the name is a derivative of an older IBM JCL. That was a, a language that was used in IBM mini computers and mainframes. Uh, and DD stood at some point that back then for data definition. Maybe that's the case, maybe not. Nobody really knows. In Linux, we tend to call it data duplicator or disk dump. And there's a lot of other similar names to that. DD is a useful command. It's a powerful command. And as such, is capable of doing serious damage. So one of the most important things that you've got to do when using any kind of disk management utility, DD, PyClone, or we're not really going to use PyClone. We're going to use a graphical wrapper around PyClone called the SD card duplicator. We got to make sure that whatever we're selecting as our target is what we want, in fact, as a target. If you accidentally select your source as the target, you're going to destroy it. It's going to be totally wiped out. And also anything that you select as a target, make sure you know that it's gonna get wiped out and replaced with a clone of your source. Man, I'm getting all kinds of honkage and wonkage and I feel the need to pay attention here. Nah, it's nothing critical. <clears throat> all right, so we're using SD card, uh, card duplicator which in turn uses PyClone, which in turn uses DD. There it is. Okay, yeah, it's no problem, Scott. Happens all the time. Okay, as I mentioned, it's a block copy. So once we've selected our source and our target, it's going to read block zero of the source and copy it to block zero of the target. And again, it's going to use DD and it's going to use the appropriate commands to do all that stuff. It'll be transparent to us. We don't care. If you try to accomplish this with DD all by yourself, it can be done. It's going to take a good bit of research. There's a, a ton of flags. DD space minus minus help will give you an idea of what those flags are. And uh, it's not well documented on how to do this manually. Uh, there are issues about whether or not you have to be a user or an SU, a super user. And it's a real pain. But here's one of the biggest pains. Let's say that this Pi is running right now. And let us envision that it has some applications running. And of course, the operating system is running. Stick that over there a little closer to the camera, right? Well, there are temp files and pieces of temp files that are in various places on the storage media. And cloning them is fine if you are able to run that clone card in exactly the same status as the source card is working. But you can't. It's a dead card. When you go to install that in some Raspberry Pi, and boot up from it, that leftover stuff, that temp stuff might not hurt anything, or it might completely cause the system to be unbootable or crash every time you boot it up. So that's one of the nice things that they did with PyClone and with the super wrapper around that. Uh, they have, they can't do anything about apps. So rule number one, shut down any apps before you start your clone job. But as far as all of the temp stuff, that the operating system makes, the utility that we'll be using knows how to ignore that and create zero byte spaces if a space needs to exist. Cool. So close running programs, don't have any live data or temp data on there. So the utility itself, I kind of beat this up to death. It's PyClone, which runs DD. If you want to go nuts and run PyClone without running it within its super wrapper, you can do that. However, there are three ways that you would think it could be done. One would be to establish an SSH connection to your Pi. We do that all the time. We use PuTTY and we use SSH. 
You can have a real actual live keyboard and mouse and screen attached. That works great. Uh, from in there, you go to the desktop and you open up a terminal session, or you can do what I'm doing here, the same thing, except I'm doing that via VNC. Well, here's rule number one. DD and PyClone won't work with an SSH connection. Can't be done. So you got to use either VNC or a physical mouse keyboard and uh, screen. Yeah, that thing. Now, let me show you something. Uh, okay, I can do this. I want to show you PyClone. Not that. This, this, this. So I've got a, a VNC connection to this server. I've opened up a terminal prompt and let me just type in PyClone. That kind of sort of works. And this is one of the steps I'm gonna show you to do. Sometimes if you're working with two of the same kinds of devices, a pair of flash drives, uh, I'm gonna clone one to the other. They will have very, very cryptic and very, very similar names. So you want to start up with just your source installed and run this utility and use this pull down menu. Now it says there's only one device in here, so I can't use a pull down. I'm just going to pull what's there, but that's okay because I'm going to need this information later. So note that it has a name, SA16G, and it's got a path and a name, WAC Dev, WAC MMC BLK0. So MMC, it's a micro SD card, and it's the first one that's used in our system. Now, later when we get a second device plugged into here, we'll be able to use this pull down menu. But even if I had that here right now, that's cool. And I'll get into what this thing does in a moment. The start button will be lit up when we do both of these boxes. And you'll click start, and you'll see here an error message that says, be careful about permissions. And then it says, oh, you don't have enough permissions to do this. Forget about it. And it'll just hang there until you close the window or close the utility or control C out or whatever. Oh, well, if I don't have enough permissions, I usually solve that problem by running a program under sudo, sudo pyclone. And notice what happens. This is no longer pull downable. And if I have two devices in here, the menu will look exactly the same. You can't run PyClone under sudo unless you do some very heavy magic. And I'll show you that heavy magic. I haven't even tested this. I'm taking this on faith that it works, but let me grab my notes right quick like. Based. So you have to add this dbus dash launch and then run PyClone. Comes up, there's a pull down menu. Yeah, that does work. So we can use PyClone from the command line and that's okay. But here's the way we're gonna do it. Let's just close this thing all together. We hit the Raspberry Pi applications icon, go down to accessories and go down to the SD card copy. It runs that dbus, uh, dbus dash whatever it was from the command line. And it runs a whole bunch of other flags and switches that enable our project to work here. But the whole point of this was just to show you that I wanna find out the official name and I would make notes on this somehow somewhere uh, before I install my going to be target device. All right, the process. How will avoid wiping out our intended source device? Well, I just showed it to you. Start with just your source 
device in there, run the SD card copier, or temporarily just run PyClone. It won't work to do a clone job, but it'll do to get the info and then fill in, look at the possible, should be only one device that can be used as a source and write down its info. So now that's the one we're gonna use when we actually go to clone it later. All right, did it. Quit that utility. All right, so now we got to set up what we want. So I get my handy dandy, whatever target I'm going to use. I'm going to copy this to another micro SD card. Just to be utterly safe, this is a 16, uh, sorry, a 32 gig card. So I know I have no problems with this. Put it into the right slot of the right thing here. It's backward. Bingo. All right, I'm going to share my server with you, and then I'll plug this in. We'll see if anything happens. Uh, this is a, a micro SD card that I totally wiped uh, using a Windows utility, using the disk part utility. But it doesn't matter. If this thing were loaded with data on all kinds of different operating systems, it would be totally OK, because it's going to get wiped out, and DD knows how to do that wipeout. All right, let me share my screen with you. Share it, click it, share it. All right, I'm going to plug this into this server. See how much damage I can do up here. Oh, man, I'm doing damage like crazy. <laughs> Okay, I see red lights on. It looks like it's plugged in. It doesn't feel like it, but we'll see what happened. This is something you have to kind of get used to, to to know to pull this off. When you plug in a micro SD card into a Raspi or into most Linux boxes, it shows up as storage device A in the dev folder. So if I do an ls WAC dev WAC SD star, there it is, SDA. If I plug in another one, it becomes SDAB and SDAC and so forth. Let's try a DF minus H. Didn't turn up on there. It's because it's not mounted. DF has to mount things. Uh, but note this. Note that there's a dev temp file system that's 404 megs. So I'm going to run that same command, and I'm going to add WAC dev WAC SDA. And there it is. And actually, it's just a, uh, a 404 meg chunk that's in the dev folder. Doesn't matter. Let's go with that. But it's plugged in. We're ready to go. You don't have to do much to this thing. The process is just simple as all get out. We hit the icon, the apps icon. We go into accessories. We go into the SD card copier. It's running that pseudo dbus PyClone utility with a whole bunch of other flags. It's gonna make sure we don't copy live data from the operating systems. And of course I shut down all running apps in here before I did this. Should also kill any running servers, which I didn't do because I tested this and it works fine. So now notice when we copy from device, there's two to pick from. Here's the one we saw previously when there was only one device. SA16G, and then here's the dev SDA. So my source copy from is going to be the SA16. And I got to pick that before the start button will light up. Now let's talk about this option here. If I'm creating a clone of a, a storage device and I want to use it in the same computer that I'm creating it in, and I'm gonna keep the old drive in. I have a problem because Linux, just like Windows or Windows, just like Linux, gives everything a unique ID, a Unix unique ID, in fact, a UUID. In Windows, we make GUIDs, globally unique identifiers. This is a Unix unique identifier. And that's how it tracks everything. Files, file names, folders, hardware, applications, storage devices, whatever. So if I have two cards, if I make a clone 
it's going to clone the UUIDs of the partitions and everything. And when I try and bring that up and the fire up the computer with both of those uh, operational at the same time, it's going to cause mass confusion and things are going to break. If I'm making a clone and my intent is to take that card and to put that in another Raspberry Pi, it's okay if it has duplicate UUIDs. Who really cares? So doesn't matter if I select this or not. Oh, heck, it'll, it'll save a little time if I don't do that. So cool. All right, well, that started. I did this before. I did it this morning to give it a test uh, to do a 16 gig partition to 16 gig partition copy takes between 20 and 24 minutes. We'll hit the start button. Are you sure? It's going to wipe out everything on, oh good, the multi-flash reader. So it's not going to wipe out everything on SG16, my source. So yeah, you want to do it? <laughs> Couldn't write to destination. It didn't look like it was plugged in fully. Let me close that, bring it out and reset it. All right, let's try that once a mo. Accessories, SD card copy. SG is my source. Multi is my target. I'll do new partitions for fun. Are you sure? Yeah. I've done something to that card in the, the system that I did, because what should happen is the next menu says checking. And that's where it's doing the size checks and a couple of other checks. And obviously it's done some kind of checking here and said, nope, not going to do this. So, okay, let me do a quick. Attempt at something here. It's not you mount. Should be a mount all on here. Yeah, mount minus A. Oh, but that's only an FS tab. Read only type source target. Specific mount point. We don't know it. Oh, let's try it this way. Mount. Minus T, whack dev, whack SDA. All right, no error message. What I'm looking for here is a utility that will wipe out that you know i'm gonna i'm not gonna abandon this for a second let me troubleshoot for just a second i'm gonna re-blast this partition with disk part which you'll be able to see what the heck All right, got some good sign there here. So I'm gonna run command prompt in admin mode. Wong, wong, wong. And then I should be able to share that with you. Disk part. Goes buzz, 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 grind, 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 checking the existence of all hard drives in here. And now we list disk. Okay, there's my 32 gig card showing up as 28. We select disk one. You can see it's got a little asterisk beside it now. 
Uh, we're actually in the disk part utility. Clear screen doesn't work. Uh, just for fun, we don't have to do this. List partition. There's no partitions on this disk. List volume. This will show all volumes on all disks. And there's a D drive left over on there from my previous exercises. That's what's going on here. So I've got disk two, disk one selected. Let's make double sure. And we hit the command clean. And that should wipe out anything on this disk. And it should happen really, really quick, like 10 seconds ago. There we go. Exit, exit. Okay, we're done with that. All right, now we remove it and plug it into the pie. We'll try and clone it again one more time. If it doesn't work, it's okay. I've shown you everything that you need to see. Uh, half tempted on, okay. If this doesn't work, I'm gonna make it work. I, I hate failure and I hate for you to not see something. I'm sharing my server with you again. Share screen. This one, there we go. Okay. <clears throat> we don't need that. We need the SD card duplicator copier. Pick SA16. Pick the multi flash. I had a, you know what? Now let's try this. I have a theory. I had different cards in my hand this morning. Let's make sure that this is a right size card. Can't tell. Let me get another card that I know is a fresh 32 gig and we'll go from there. How big is this Kingston? Sixty-four. That ought to be big enough, right? I got thunder here, guys. <laughs> and I plug that in. I want to unplug it from the USB port and plug it back in to one just to make double certain. I have a stack of pies here that are rubber banded together and one, there we go, that felt a nice click, <clears throat> has rotated in such a way that it's causing a challenge. Okay, last chance, this works or it doesn't. Okay, we can pick either of these. We'll pick SA16. There's the card reader. We'll make new partitions. Come on, baby. I have no idea what the heck has happened here. But it worked this morning. It'll work with yours. It's just not fair. All right, so let me talk about a couple of other goodies here. And of course, I'll troubleshoot this all week and I'll tell you next week the one stupid simple thing that I forgot to do or wasn't set right or whatever the case may be. So when you're done, I did uh, the one this morning, I copied a 16 to a 32. It took somewhere between 20 and 24 minutes because I turned my head at some point. And I didn't run the time utility at the beginning of it. I'm gonna get these all set aside so I can troubleshoot them tonight. But uh, 
there's still a couple things that you need to do. First things first, if I started out with this small partition, this 16 gig card, and I do a block copy to a 32 gig card or a 64 or a big you know, terabyte SSD. Well, one of the things that it copies in the beginning is the partition table, right? And the partition table for this little card said, I got a 16 gig drive and the entire partition is on that drive. So that's what's gonna be on your micro, on your, uh, your target. So you can resize that. Now, again, the DD command is the command that's actually run, but I'm gonna share my server with you and show you the other way. Can hear you sharing, it's caring. The easiest way to do this is from the command line. So you're gonna boot up from this new card and then you're gonna resize the partition or you can use the script that Mr. Quick has got for us. But I would do sudo raspy config because raspy config has a dash in it. And then we go down into advanced options and you would select this number one, expand file system. And that will move the partition to the entire size of the hard drive. And that's probably the last of the customizing steps that you're gonna do. Is let's talk about this real world use for this thing. Unshare that. I, I kind of laid out the groundwork for this about four weeks ago uh, when I, I talked about what we were going to do and, and how and why I do this. Oftentimes, I will take a course on the road that has 10 almost identical pies, but they have to have two differences. Every pie has to have a unique name, and every pie has to have a unique IP address. I can solve the IP address problem in advance simply by making it a, a DHCP client. And depending on the network environment that I'm going into, sometimes I do that. But sometimes I need them to be specific IP addresses. So I can say at table one, the IP address of this Raspberry Pi is going to be 192.168.1.101. At table two, dot 102 and 103 and so forth. So I know who's got what IP addresses and I can make labs work and I know why somebody's not working and so forth. So that's what I'll do. I will start by cloning 10 drives. Let's say they all have the same static IP address. They all have the same host name. They all have the wrong partition size. So when I get done with the clone job, now I'll take that master one out of the pie that I was used to create them with, take one of the clones, doesn't matter which one, pop it in, boot it up, and either RNC to it or whatever, VNC to it. I'm gonna change the host name. I'm going to do whatever I need to do with the IP address. And then I'm gonna expand the file system size. Done, shut down, do the next one and do that 10 times. And doing that 10 times isn't a particularly time consuming process. If you add to that, the fact that my usual classes have 16 gig cards, there's a half an hour worth of time to do all that cloning, that's that's a day, but it's not something I have to babysit. I plug it in, I run the command, and then I work for the next half hour while it's doing its thing. So now if I had to do 50 of these or 100 of these, I'm gonna come up with a much better way. There are better ways, but to do a few clone jobs here and there, that's how we did uh, our Raspberry Pi cluster. I made five, I made a template, and then I made five different uh, cloned cards based on that. So that's cloning. Now, here's the other really cool thing about it. If you clone a bootable device, I had a micro SD card here as my master. I set it up with everything that I need for my class. It's got a web server in it and it's got Wireshark installed on it and, 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 and. All those things are set up and ready to go and I'm booting off of it. Well, that boot partition is starts at 
logical block zero at block zero. And this thing did a block copy. So it's going to put it here. I don't need Rufus and I don't need the Microsoft creator utility. This thing is bootable now. So all I've got to do in a RAS 3 or a RAS 4 is plug it in. I don't need a micro SD card, power it up, and it boots up. Same goes for an external hard drive. Same goes for an external M2 or SSD. So that's one of the great magical pieces of cloning. All right. Don't know why it gagged. I'll figure it out. I'll do a quick announcement next week on what it was. And if it's worthwhile, I'll demo it. It's weird. <laughs> All right. In the background, I'm going to do something. I'm going to reboot this Pi. And maybe I'll try that again just for hoots when it comes up. Shut down, reboot. Okay, yeah, that's rebooting. And let's look and talk to you and see what's happened on the feed since then. Move you to there. Put this up there. And put this here. All right. So we left off somewhere around 252, 253. Yep, super scrolled, of course. All right, a little bit came up. Oh, when you make clones, make sure they're programmed with Order 66. <laughs> or Section 31. All right, that re cannot currently show desktop. What are you going on? Yeah, there is something weird going on with my pie. Looks like it's a pie issue. Yeah, it's coming up. I'm going to do this in the background. I'm going to try one more clone job. If it uh, starts happening, I'll switch over so you can see what it's doing. But basically, it doesn't do anything other than show you uh, cloning partition one, cloning partition two, and give you a progress bar along the way. I'm hesitant to do this and have you watch as I do it, just so you can see another failure. Hey, I've said this before, man. This is Raspberry Pi. It's good stuff. It's been around for a few years. It's still wild, wild west. It ain't Windows. There was a lot of news in the last two days about people putting Windows 11 in a VM on Raspberry Pi. Uh, it went from here's how to do it two days ago to here's a script to do it. And this just popped up today when Pi Apps did an update. Did I double click that fast enough? No. There we go. Checketh out thou this. Down here in tools, buzz, buzz, grind, grind. Windows Flasher. And if we go to the info screen on here, this is the script to install Win 10 or Win 11 in a VM on a Raspberry Pi SD card. Is that true? No, that exists. What this thing is, is it just goes out to uh, the source. It, it uses the Raspberry Pi to burn an image on a micro SD card and then you can use those other utilities to uh, make a clone or install it in a VM. Okay, let's try this one more time just for hoots. I got everything plugged in. It's a fresh boot, accessories, SD card copier. There's our source. There's our destination. Give them new partition information, crossing fingers. You really want to do it? Yeah, I really want to do it. Hey, there we go. <laughs> ah, I have no idea. Man, it's a disappointment. Okay. But there it is. All right. So four-part process, right? If you really want to get down to it, maybe less. Number one, we clone the card. We, we clone equal size cards or a smaller to a larger device. Doesn't have to be a card. 
Number two, customize the card by giving a unique name and possibly making appropriate adjustments to how you're handling IP addresses. And number three, so I think that's two and three. And then number four, resize the file system. Done. All right, I'm troubleshooting in my head. <laughs> I gotta let it go. I'm reading questions here. Hey guys, Zach, sorry I'm late. Hope you're well. If you have IFTTT connected to your Google Home Mini or the like, you can actually say execute order 66 and it'll be fun. Okay. Reading questions, passing three o'clock here. Everybody checking in with Zach. Just finished building Lego box <laughs> 76. And you're out of fermented page. <laughs> so do are, are Lego heads the type that say, I know this product by its model number, 76198? You know, if I'm going to build a Lego, it's going to be, I don't know, a Millennium Falcon or something like that. I know that, but uh, I, I presume they all have five digit code numbers. And hey, I got 76198. Finally, I've been waiting for it for two years. Yeah, still a run. It's just past 2200 hours. Time to go to the store. And not so much. Nice cooler on that pie. Thank you. Yep, you've seen that guy before. That's some that's an ice tower. I have not done anything with IFTT on Raspberry Pi. I don't know what IFTTT is. I'm sure it's some IoT thing. Not in this small village. 1,500 people. Nice. That's the size of my kids' graduating class. <laughs> Raymond Quick, just sent scripts I use with small, probably poor description. Cool. Thank you very much. I'll look into that, and I will respond to you and, and tell you how it worked for me and along with this other thing. Hey, that would be kind of cool if we do this. Uh, we get this work, and I find out what the, the core problem is. I'll do that, and I'll experiment with Raymond's script all week and uh, see if we can demo that. That would be very cool. So like this is zero clean. <laughs> I'm so terrified when I use clean. Okay, only a little bit. Better than open water, sure. Mixed up the cards and then, you know, it's, I, I read it, it says 32. I And that's the one that I used this morning. So it may be something about the way disk part cleans it. But I've used this part in the past to clean that. That's an interesting idea. I got another. Okay. I'll come up with something. It'll be brilliant. All right. Raymond's off. Thank you so much. I probably missed a goodbye for him, but not by much. Reading questions. <laughs> I don't know if that's a, a... <laughs> not going there. I don't know what that is. I haven't been up to date, officially out in October. Right, October 5th is when Win 11 is coming out. It won't work on my machine. My machine, I bought used from a guy. And the guy set up a GPT partition instead of a UFI partition. Now I have a a third party utility that says it will convert it. You can't do it natively with Windows, <laughs> but it just says it will safely convert GPT to UFI. And I'm terrified to do it, but I want Win 11. So sometime in the next month, I'm going to back up all the critical stuff off of here, make notes about the apps that I'm going to have to reinstall and I'm going to do it. Uh, I, I did some early attempts to do that and wound up making my machine unbootable. Uh, and that one took two to three hours to fix. You, just, you would think it's just uh, un, unset the setting that you did, but no, it does some pretty heavy magic and damage to it. So when I go, I will be prepared to totally lose the drive and start from scratch if I have to. Also think it's not going to work. The laptop is five years old. Uh, it doesn't have TPM2, but I'm reading a lot of things that says 
they're scaling back on some of the requirements for initial installation. So we'll see if TPM2 is one of the ones that gets eased up on. but it's out unofficially. Yes, it's been out unofficially for a couple of months now. Uh, there was a leaked release a couple of months ago that lots of people installed. I installed it on my computer down at the office. Uh, and then Microsoft has a uh, an official pre-release channel. You can get that from them. So you don't need the bootleg one. Right, it's not the final version yet. Uh, the first one won't be the final version. It'll be hairy and people will have troubles. That's how it goes, right? Uh, I need to get out from under your rock more often. Nice, Andre. <laughs> Could you make a clone of your current Windows installation and put it in a VM and run it? Yes. Yes, I believe that you could. Um, you're going to need an 8 gig raspberry pi 4 you need a big old storage device uh, or you have to shrink the partitions on windows to you know be able to get to a, a clone and you know really all you're doing at that point and we're not going to use pi clone or anything like that we're going to use uh whatever clone tools or image burner tools that are available in the windows environment cd burner cd uh, cdxp burner is what we've been using at uh at total seminars for years it's ancient and it still works but yeah i mean talk about size issues that's going to be huge and performance wise you're asking a lot but we've done that we've done vms with windows and with wine we do use v, uh, vbox 86 and then wine and between those two things we can run windows programs and that requires a, a windows installation but i think performance wise a boot up could take hours days two days from now not yet unless we're talking unless that's when you're coming out of your rock andre de goyer i love my wife she brought me some more fermented grape juice <laughs> very nice Okay, caught up on questions. Let's see what else is in my handy dandy notes here. Uh, we're going to wind up. Uh, I pretty much got shut down stuff and uh, talk about what's coming up in subsequent weeks. So if you've got more questions, we're going to do them. Please hit the uh, like and subscribe on here. We didn't have a lot of people today. Didn't expect a lot. Uh, this is uh, a three-day weekend in the U.S. Uh, we have Monday off. Mike is planning on doing his show on Monday. He has no special that he's announced so it's going to be q a at the moment see what happens and otherwise it's a four-day week for me next week i will be here doing my regular stuff with a project see if i missed anything here in the store in the steps hey you want to go crazy should i do this i feel like doing this I wonder if I mangled the pie that I did this on, and it would be interesting to try it on another pie. <laughs> I got time to kill, so I'm going to do it. Oh, what is all that stuff plugged into there? Who knows? All right, there's a Raspberry Pi 4. Ooh, let me show you my Res Pi 4 and what I've been doing with that while I get this prepped. Come here, you get out of there. This is a $3 piece of junk, $4. It's a sound card. It's a USB sound card, as a matter of fact. I'm gonna make sure this is actually a 64-bit card. And at my, my mage and age, the eyes aren't as powerful as they used to be, so use my, yeah, okay, 64. I use the zoom on the camera on my phone instead of a magnifying glass, like my father did. <laughs> Plug this in. We plug this in there. We plug it into some Raspberry Pi. This four. Let's go nuts and plug it into a USB three port.
I think I know the problem here, guys. I think my USB writer may have gotten a bend or something in it because I'm having a tough time inserting it. Yeah, it's going to fail again, but we'll know why now. <clears throat> but I got solutions for that if that turns out to be the problem. And then I'll finish talking about this little handy dandy device. Okay. Share a screen. DNC, I put that into blue mesh. This is my PlexPy server. Okay, now we share that. All right, if it doesn't work, we know the reason. It's the reader, writer. See how big this card is? Okay, it's a 32. I'm using a 64 as a target. Okay, is an MMC block zero. Flash reader will make new UUIDs. Crossing fingers, yes. I've damaged my card reader. Okay, well, that's good to know. I have had that thing for so many years. It is not surprising. I get to go to Micro Center this weekend. <laughs> okay, so this is a little sound card. Uh, when I plug cameras in to the Raspberry Pis, all the cameras that I've used and plugged in so far have had built-in microphones. But I have a camera that doesn't have one, and so there is no native microphone input into that. I've got a project going on with a, a Raspberry Pi Pico to turn a Pico into a microphone. But in the meantime, it was a dollar flea market find. Uh, got that up and, and somewhat going. I plugged my handy dandy little microphone into it and now I've got a dedicated mic. And it's kind of a cool little project that I've been practicing or playing with. I don't believe it's the reader. Nah. Okay, how are we doing here? We got eight more minutes. We're good. Checking notes to see if there's any steps that I missed that I wanted you to know about. If you do a clone and you want to boot from it externally, uh, you know, make it a, you're booting from a flash driver, an external USB based whatever. Oh, I see what's going on there. If you plug it into a current Raspi 4, should work fine. If you plug it into a Raspi 3, should be fine. But the early models of Raspi 4 weren't bootable with external, with USB media. They've got that fixed. There's a, a software patch to, for that. And if you need that, uh, see the drama episode in the archives, not my document, not my archives on my server, but uh, the YouTube archives uh, from December 4th, 2020. We did an episode on how to make your older, your newest, the, the earliest Raspberry Pi models bootable. And if you've got that and you haven't written it down here, download today's archive notes off my server and it's in there. All right, so that's all of that stuff. Next week's show. I've gone through this list a couple of weeks ago. I'll go through it again. I haven't picked one. I'm just looking at this today. Uh, but we did clone your Raspberry Pi OS. I'm going to do sometime in the next couple, two months, uh, two to three Raspberry Pi Pico projects because we gave those away free at the anniversary show and just kind of left people to sink or swim with them. And that's wrong. So uh, I got a really simple one. Uh, 
how to use some of the internal stuff on there. There's an internal temperature sensor and an internal LED, so you don't need any additional hardware. And we can make it blink and we can make it read temperature and do all kinds of good stuff with that. We still have RetroPie on the burners. We got Minecraft server on the burner. I know a number of you want to do that, and I'm thoroughly committed to doing that in short order. Turning a Pi into a WAP, turning a Pi into a router. Uh, an advanced one that we're going to do, we'll do K8 clusters. We'll install Ubuntu on those. We've done that before. We've installed Ubuntu uh, and done some interesting Docker work on them. But now we're going to do K8 clusters, uh, Kubernetes or Kubernetes. Uh, here's some stuff I found recently. How about installing Android on a Raspberry Pi? They've been working on that with mixed results pretty much since the Pi came out. Of course, the original Pi came out with its 256 megs of RAM. Uh, pretty tough to put an, a decent OS on there. But I'm seeing a, a lot of very successful work with getting Android running on a Raspberry Pi. So we're going to do that. Uh, we got to make an email server. Uh, Jason, I think, is interested in that more than uh, somebody else is. That will happen in less than four weeks. Definitely got to do that. Uh, and then one that I'm really looking forward to, we've made servers that can play media from stored devices or from stream video, right? Our PlexPy servers and our Kodi servers can do that. I've got my favorite audio streaming server that plays all kinds of different audio sources. Uh, Volumio, but I want to do it the other way around. Ultimately, we'll do two projects. One of them is I want to make a, a server that is a source for casting audio out there, be a, basically an online pirate radio station. And then we'll explore down road doing that again with, well, I don't know, this counts, right? We, it, It's very easy to do video to YouTube or video to Zoom on a Raspberry Pi these days. So maybe we'll do something on that. Uh, but there's other ways to do streaming video. Going to do a house a household sprinkler system. That one requires a couple of bucks. You got to buy solenoids. You got to buy water valves and things like that. But a lot of people are interested in that. I've mentioned this in the past. Uh, we can put a Raspberry Pi on a lightning detection network. So it reports to a grand database. And you see lightning strike activity all over the world, wherever people have these things. I got the big dot matrix display. We got projects up the wazoo. So let me look over this real quick and see if I can pick one for next week. Cloning, Pico, Minecraft, routers, clusters, Android, email. All right, tell you what, unless I have problems with it or find one of these to be more interesting, we're going to set up an email server next week. Turn your Raspberry Pi into your own dedicated email server. Challenges with that, right? You're going to need a domain, so DDNS is going to come into play. Uh, maybe a, a email.zapto.org, something like that. All right, any last questions here? Let me take a look at that, and then otherwise we'll start winding things up. Got to go over there, got to go over there. That's where the questions are. All right, what popped up here? Oh, good Lord, the pizza pineapple fight. Sorry, man. Pineapple and ham on a pizza. You can't beat it. I was thinking about putting my current Windows setup in a VM when Win 11 comes up. Sure, that works. But I would do that on a real computer. No, it's not Scott. I love pineapple, but it's not supposed to be on pizza. Yes, it is. I've had kangaroo on pizza. Had kangaroo. It's not that good, but it's a good bucket list thing. Yeah, Micro Center. Time to get on AliExpress, order a new one. Yeah. yeah I know, because I can't go down to fries anymore, but I'll head down to Micro Center this weekend. I haven't decided if I'm going to work the back channel on Monday, if we're going to travel. We'll see. What was that chain that closed? Wasn't it a Microsoft? No, Fry's is the one that closed. Yeah. I'm also interested in an email server. Good. Okay. 
Pies are getting expensive. I've been looking getting a pie zero for pie hole, but prices are up around 40 pounds for a zero, 40 euros for a zero. That is totally resistant. Go straight to the source. They're not raising the prices. Uh, heck, you're in Europe. Go to uh, the, 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 just go to raspberrypie.org uh, and look. You make me look. No, I don't have time. It's on the hour. Uh, I'll talk about it on Discord. You can get them cheaper. Just don't get them from resellers. Micro Center doing good. Yes, they're doing fine. Micro Center near me is packed all the time. Yep, mine too. All right, well, let's close things up then. It's been great to see you all. We got the full two hours in. We got all the steps of the project in and sorry about the failure, but at least it's something simple and hardware and we'll get that beat up in short time. We'll try uh, Raymond Quick's script if we can get that in and then we'll start on an email server. I'm not sure if that's going to take two episodes, but I'm excited. I have always wanted to do a pie based email server. I've done them in the past on PCs. Mike and I did one uh, once for a video, but all right. So as always, my eternal gratitude to, first of all, Scott Jernigan for his tireless efforts working the back channel on here while he continues to work for Total Seminars. You're amazing. I don't do that very well, Scott. So kudos to you. My thanks to Mike for letting me have this time to talk with you. My thanks most of all to you guys this doesn't happen without you. We're doing it as long as we can. I am David Rush, Senior Instructor at Total Seminar and Seminars and Resident Pie Specialist. I wish you a great weekend. Take care of each other. Take serious steps to stay healthy. Call or visit your parents and your family. And never forget, technology is great, but the greatest resource we have are you and I. Good night. I'll see you on Discord in 10 or 15 minutes and at some AMA next week. And until then, I am out of here.